Recordology. Hey everybody, welcome back to Recordology. Okay, today we're taking a look at a Goodwill thrift find. I have no idea if this works. If there's anything wrong with it, I have no idea what that is yet. All I know is that it's a Sony boombox from 1990 and that it is the CFS 204 radio cassette recorder which I paid $5.99 for. So Goodwill is interesting because like if it doesn't work, if it's so bad, I don't even want to work on it. If it's so bad, it's just too far gone. I can always take it back and get my money back for store credit. So considering that we're there, you know, shopping for stuff for the show, it's a pretty safe bet. So we're going to test it out. Now this thing really baffled me at first because I didn't see any way to power it other than the batteries. In fact, on the back, I see what looks like a knockout for an AC power supply, but takes six C batteries. This thing's already hefty as it is. So once, you know, if there's not, maybe there's batteries in there now. I don't even looked in there to see if there's batteries in there. So, but I was really perplexed. I'm like, really? It's battery operated only? And I've had this thing for several days now. So it was like, you know, then as I'm setting up for this show, literally, I'm like, oh, Okay, <laughs> I don't know how I missed that. So as such, I've got a uh, stockpile of C batteries here and we'll just use that because that's what I happen to bring to the table today, so to speak. So yeah, 1990 and uh, yeah, it is what it is. It's a, it, no CD, it's a, just a tape boom box. When I was a kid, my mom gave me a Sanyo, really cool Sanyo with surround speakers that were kind of angled on the sides. And it had, an, it actually had RCA inputs for adding a CD player. But this one doesn't have any mention of adding anything to it. It's just, is what it is. Made in the Philippines. Again, 1990, from what I could tell, it's dirty as heck. It needs to be cleaned. And I will clean it too as part of what we're gonna do. I hate, as you know, I hate dirty equipment. So for me, part of this is even before I power it on, I will wipe it down with some Clorox wipes. By the way, you know it's not a pleasant sensation? Getting one of these out, it's dripping wet. It doesn't actually have bleach. They don't actually have bleach, but still, it's very strong chemical. It kills everything, right? So getting one of these out and then getting it, somehow whipping it up in the, in the air to wash it or to use it or something and having a drop go right in to the corner of your eye. That happened to me about a week ago. Burned? but it was better than I thought it would be. I was able to flush it out. I thought, okay, there goes that eye. I hope I... <laughs> That's all I need to improve my looks, an eye patch. <sighs> but anyway, so we'll be wiping it down with this, kill any germs that are on there, and just get the dust off. I mean, dust is awful. Dust is dried skin. That's what dust mostly is. So this is somebody's dried freaking skin. Look at that, filthy. But before we do that, let's peruse the features. So. It is going to be a cassette mechanism. It is auto shut off, one touch recording. So that means you don't have to press play and record, just record. It's got AM, FM. It's got a microphone built in, a battery and operation light, tone control, volume control, headphone jack, tuning dial. That's it. It's a simple, simple device. So I am going to give it a good wipe down and then we'll power it up, see if it works. Okay, so I've got it pretty well cleaned up. I mean, it was dirty as expected. It's kind of drying now, that's why it looks weird. So let's look in the battery compartment. I did not look in here yet. Good, there's no batteries in there. I'm glad for that. There are cobwebs though, so let me go ahead and just clean in here as well. All right, let's go ahead and load it up with um, some C-cell batteries. I always prefer going off of just AC power. Because I'm always thinking, you know, are the batteries wearing down? Is that affecting tape speed? Oh yeah, something else I wanted to mention too is that some of the early Sony boomboxes would actually have a um, port where you could connect the Walkman, which is kind of weird. I don't really get the point of that because it's like your Walkman can do everything that this can do. You know what I mean? So what's the point of that? All right, so turned on to the radio. So at least the radio works. Let's go ahead and adjust tuning here. It's good and loud. Very loud. I mean, the volume's only at 40%, maybe. 
Mark. Wow. Llegaron. Y tenemos una oportunidad de regresar a la... Very strong sounds. Flip it to AM. The vegetables. It's basically cleansing. Wow, even the AM is booming. Brad O'Brien. Good sound. He's a real estate attorney. You know, back in this era, the fact that it was a Sony was really something. I feel like the, the strength of the brand has suffered in the in the last 10, 15 years. But it used to be, if it's a Sony, you knew it was good. And so far, what I'm hearing is that emphasizes this. If we were to look at a modern reproduction retro, quote unquote, boombox, the same size, it just would sound tinny, it would sound thin, it wouldn't be as rugged as this. There would be a difference even at this point. But I don't want to get too excited because we haven't, you know, checked out the main point, which is the uh, cassette player. So let us do that now. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so you can see what's going on here. I try to minimize the use of the zoom in on this because the iPhone that I have doesn't have the telephoto. So every time I zoom in, I'm actually magnifying the image and losing resolution. I've got full resolution, wide angle, and ultra wide angle. But when I do that zoom in, I uh, it technically loses information. So I try to, um, you know, not do that too much. All right, let's go ahead and eject the tape mechanism. As you can see, it is a wide piece that ejects, not just what you need for the tapes. And uh, let's see if we can get a peek inside. Peeking through the window here, and again, I apologize for the fogginess of that plastic, but we do indeed have a stereo head, which is good. Controllers look clean. Keeping our fingers crossed that the belts are in good shape. So now we take out ye old test tape and we go to town. Keeping our fingers crossed. Actually, I need to rewind this because I'm on the wrong end of this tape. So, oh wait, no, I'm not. I am, am I? Yes, I'm on the wrong end of this tape. So let's start by finding out if it rewinds. No, oh, it does not rewind. Nothing on the rewind. Okay, let's just cut to the chase. Let me flip it over. Does it play? It does play. Yes. Okay. Okay, so if I fast forward. No fast forward. So no fast forward, no rewind, but it does play. Occasional drop out there. I haven't cleaned the head, so it could just be dirty heads. Sound quality is fine. It's a little bit more muted. I wouldn't say muffled, but a little bit more muted than perhaps a higher end deck. But it sounds better than a Tanishin clone, I can tell you that. Bummed we get no rewind, no fast forward. So there's obviously a belt or something that is goofy. So let me do this. Let me cue up the tape to a different place. I want to test out the record on this as well. Okay. So I took the tape to another machine, rewound it so we can test the record. So what we'll need to do is record on this side and then flip it back, play it in reverse to get it to cue back up. So, okay, one touch recording means that I can just hit the record button and it goes to town. So the microphone is right up here and it's gonna be a basic condenser microphone. But my guess is that the sound quality will be somewhat better than what we're accustomed to with a lot of the modern stuff. You know, there is a major element of truth to the fact that when it comes to retro cassette versus modern cassette, there is a palpable difference. And if you can get a working retro machine, that's actually, I mean, a working vintage machine, excuse me, that is um, the way you want to go for sure because you know the new ones are just it just there's just limitations this you know m this mechanism was probably manufactured by sony by sony or somebody underneath their control with a much tighter spec that they were trying to hit compared to what is out there today um that being said you know with older equipment you run into issues where there's capacitors that need replacing and if that's not something that you're comfortable doing then sometimes you know you're screwed in that regard too. So it just depends. Now, when I was cleaning this, 
these uh, were sopping and I totally went over the mic. So hopefully I didn't damage the mic. So, okay, let's go ahead. And again, I can't rewind, unfortunately. It's really weird. But let's go ahead and I'm gonna play this back. And once it's queued up, we'll give it a listen. So to my horror, just a minute ago, I wish I was rolling when I did this. I noticed, <laughs> I noticed that this spool was rotating counterclockwise and this one was rotating clockwise. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not good. <laughs> so sure enough, kids, look what happened. Oh, can I even open it now? Okay. Oh, she ate the tape. Oh, oh this sucks. It is. That pinch roller went to town. Went to town on my test tape. How much of it it got, I don't even know. Yeah. This is why you don't put in your prize cassette tape to test a Goodwill boombox. So, yes. Alrighty then. So we're gonna take this apart and see what's going on inside. I did take one screw out already. They have these really, really long brass screws. Typical construction for the period. This opening here goes all the way back to this point. And this faceplate is really where it's connected. So you have to have a long throw screwdriver. This one barely fits. And I'm hoping I can get the other ones out too. Because if I tried to use my usual screwdriver, it'll be way too wide. So, okay, well let me do that off camera and we'll see what's inside. Okay, so I ended up resorting to my trusty Stanley screwdriver. I just wasn't getting enough torque with this. So, here's the moment of truth, you guys have got it unscrewed. Let's see what we got in here. Sometimes when you get, look at all that dust, look at that nasty cobwebs and stuff. See, even all the cleaning you can do on the outside is only gonna minimally impact the inside. So we have legit Sony speakers on the inside there. They are soldered to the terminals. They are plugged in down here. So we can displace this piece. And what you can do if you have the inclination to do so, you can actually, if you get it down to just bare plastic, like if we were to take the speakers off, remove the wiring, you could run this whole, this whole piece in the sink, if your wife lets you do that. Or in like, you know what I mean, like a shop sink or something, or take it to the car wash, I don't know, just blast the heck out of it. That's the only way you're gonna get it perfectly clean because on the flip side, it doesn't look that bad. But as you can see, it's filthy. Okay, so let's see what we got here. There is a Sony IC in there. There is the ferrite rod antenna. This is on a Sony PCB, you can see at the back there. There is the cassette mechanism. It uses the top-down plungers. Now we've got a great look at that head. It is a One Direction stereo head. A lot of dust, but you know, to be expected. Over here, we have a circuit board that's got some protection on it. This is the power circuit, so it's there to protect you and to isolate interference and all that good stuff. Up here, we've got some potentiometers. Another Sony board. There's the preamp stage that's labeled. I think that's cool. Sony cap. Is that a Sony cap? Can't quite tell. That blue cap looks like it's in good shape. So there's a little blue cap and then even littler blue caps. Now visually isn't the, you know, you need to do more than just visually grade it, but the visual inspection makes me think that it is in operational condition, uh, at least to some degree, because if a cap blows, it'll blow right out the top. But not always, they can fail without blowing, so it just depends. There's the bottom of the focus wheel. It uses a, uh, is that a interesting how there's like this take up slot. That's interesting. Instead of a string, it uses like a piece of plastic that goes along this track up here. Isn't that amazing? That is so cool, I love it. Yeah, it's a simple cassette mechanism. There's a lot of plastic in there, a lot of plastic in there. Let's take a look behind the motor, or behind the tape assembly. You can see the motor down there. This is probably a single motor unit. Higher end units have two motors. In order to get to the belt, we'll probably have to remove the cassette mechanism. So 
let me go ahead and do that and we'll take a look underneath there. Okay, so I was able to remove this piece as the tuning piece and a couple of screws and the whole tape mechanism popped out. As you can see, there's one insulated wire kit going to um, the actual head itself. And I wanna make sure I unravel this in the right way here. So there's a look at that motor again. With the date code on it, as you can see, everything here is mega filthy. Another good look at that stereo head. Flipping it around here, let's look at some belt stuff. Here is the main drive belt and the flywheel. That all seems good. I do not see a separate belt for fast forward. It looks like this belt is the belt. And like I said, tension is, is okay. Flywheel is good. No, there is a secondary belt. So you can see we do have two belts here. We have this belt and then there's this one back here which is hard to film, but there's another angle of it. You can see it's right in there. And both belts seem okay. They could be, there could be loose enough tension, just enough to cause the rewind and fast forward. That's kind of loose actually. So those belts probably just need to be replaced or tightened up. Interesting, but it's all there. There's no broken belts or missing parts. So my guess is the fast forward and rewind just has to do with loose belts, but not bad belts. And it's at this point you say to yourself, is it really worth putting it back together, investing in belts and all that stuff? Or do you just say it was a $5 experiment? Hope you all had fun. <laughs> okay, so I took everything and blasted it out with deoxid, did a little more detailing while I had it open. I just can't help myself. I can't stand dirty electronics. Also, I um, had a good look at this mechanism, knowing that the belts are intact and it should spin to some degree, yet as we know, they don't. So I thought I'd play around with it and see if there was any issue with the linkage. So using, let's see, where is it? Using the flywheel here to sort of actuate things, if I depress it into either fast forward or rewind, I can spin the flywheel and as you can see, the gears move. So it's making physical contact. That belt is doing, you know, somewhat of what it should do. And if I press the other one, you can see it works here as well. So I feel like even perhaps under load, that belt is just too stretched out. I don't know. This was not working at first, so perhaps I unseized something that was seized. I do want to clean off this head since I got some isopropyl out. Careful not to get anything caught on it. And then with the leftover isopropyl, I'm just going to clean out this area a little bit. The pinch roller looks good and clean, I mean relatively. You can use a little bit of isopropyl on that. You don't want to dry it out too much. I'm probably going to get my money back. I don't think I want to invest in belts for something like this. It does have belts and they do seem to work manually, but I think that when it's under load, they might just be a little bit too stretched and loose to work. So that's the case. I don't want to have to get down to that level because you start having to take apart a million pieces. As you can see, it's between this panel, which is riveted and glued in tight and all of this. It's not just a matter of loosening screws. So again, for a $5 boom box, I don't know if it's worth that investment, but let's go ahead and see if once I get it back together, assuming I can get it back together, if we solve our problem. Okay, I've got it all back together after cleaning it out. Even if I give this back or trade this back to Goodwill, I will have done them the world a service by literally cleaning this out. It is almost clean enough to eat on. I wouldn't recommend it though. Okay, so I've got everything put back together and let's go ahead and see if it works, putting in the yield test tape again. Definitely crinkled the tape up a bit, but I'm mostly curious to see if that fast forward and rewind is working out. So let's test that out. Okay, so here goes rewind. Oh, you can see it try to pull on it. You can see it just doesn't have the torque. It's just got to be, there's fast forward, same thing. The belts are just too loose to do it under load. Let's see if it'll do it without a tape in there. Yeah. See, because there's no load, no problem whatsoever. Even the fast forward without a load has a problem. 
So that's going to do it for today, guys. We gave it a good effort. It plays. The radio works fine. The rewind and fast forward is a deal breaker, obviously, for me. I'm going to take it back, get my five, six bucks back, reinvest it elsewhere. But an interesting look at an interesting vintage 1990. I say 90 or 91. Anyway, a vintage early 90s boombox. So that's going to do it for now, guys. Happy record hunting. We will see you tomorrow.